Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our event on Europe Awakened. Today, we're going to discuss the seismic shifts that we've seen in the transatlantic relationship in Europe and look ahead to the coming year, including the 75th anniversary of NATO and the many decisions that European and US allies have to take. To do so, we're joined by a lot of combined experience and knowledge on the transatlantic relationship, both in and out of government, uh, and a lot of deep knowledge on the alliance uh, binding our two continents. Kathleen McInnes is Senior Fellow in the International Security Program here at CSIS and the Director of the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative, uh, who is returning to us from a first stint a few years ago. <laughs> Uh, you've done fascinating work on the intersection of gender and national security. You also focus on global security strategy, the transatlantic relationship and defense issues. You've worked at the Congressional Research Service before um, as a senior expert to Congress and, of course, in the Office of Secretary of Defense working on NATO operations in Afghanistan. Next, we have Jim Townsend, who is an adjunct senior fellow at the Center for New American Security's Transatlantic Security Program. Uh, Jim, you served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for European and NATO Policy, quite relevant to today's conversation. You also served in a variety of government roles, focused on political reconstruction in Europe, on bilateral defense relations, NATO enlargement and reform, I could go on and on, and you served as uh, VP at Atlantic Council as well. We're representing a lot of think tank backgrounds here today. His most important role was he was my boss in the Pentagon. Absolutely. Yeah, of so course. How could I forget? As I remember, you were my boss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about this. And then finally, we have Max Bergman, who's the director of the Europe, Russia, and Eurasia program here at CSIS and of the Stewart Center in Euro Atlantic and Northern European Studies. Uh, Max, you served in Department of State and the policy planning staff, working on political military affairs, non-proliferation, arms control, international security. You can read all the very long bios online. And you also worked at the Center for American Progress before at CSIS on Europe, Russia, and U.S. security cooperation. So I'm really excited to be here today in the illustrious presence of all of this knowledge. Um, the topic of today's conversation, I think, is very obvious to everyone. There was such a shock almost a year ago to the Euro-Atlantic community to see Russia's uh, full-fledged invasion of Ukraine after the first part in 2014, and really the return of war on the European continent. Um, a lot has been done or said. You've all written a lot about this. I would like to start for, with a question for all of you. What has struck you the most about the transatlantic relationship, uh, the transatlantic response to the war so far, being on the NATO side or the EU side? Kathleen, why don't we start with you? Sure. You know, as I was reflecting on this panel and, and thinking about some of the key things that, that stood out to me as, as a result of all of this, actually, it's actually before the war that, that really strikes me struck me as powerful the, the use of intelligence by the u.s intel community and and the the, the biden administration um to show what russia was going to be doing and to use intelligence in that strategic way to help forge consensus and make the alliance and and europe and the global community more broadly more resilient against um planned russian disinformation operations I think that's an incredible moment for 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 the transatlantic relationship, and, um, and 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 a powerful tool that we'll probably need to use in the future. So I think there's a lot of really powerful lessons to be learned. But remember, though, you know, even though we had those the, those those releases of intelligence and sort of spoiling uh, Putin's game plan in. Um, before it could play out, there was still a lot of doubt, right? There was still a lot of like, no, no, Putin is not really, he can't really do this. He can't be serious. This is absolute crazy pants stuff. And I think that that's the other thing that is strategically significant about all of this. There is a, a, a recognition that Putin's rationality is not something that we that resonates with us, right? And, and we've perhaps been mirror imaging and group thinking a little bit too much when we think about Putin and his actions and, and, and looking forward what he might do next. Um, some scholars call that 
um, the ability to anticipate an adversary or understand their mindset, something called strategic empathy. And it seems to me that we've the, the, the invasion of Ukraine by Putin, that decision to go even though it was just did not, we could not make sense of it, suggests that we, we need to cultivate our ability to have strategic empathy within our institutions. Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And as I was um, reflecting as well on, on that question, it's interesting how quickly we came together in the old mode of the U.S. leadership, the allies falling in behind us, once that shock happened. You know, um, as Kathleen said beforehand, uh, as we were going around with the intelligence, as we were talking to allies, there wasn't an agreement uh, as, at all. Uh, there was a lot of doubt for the lot of reasons that Kathleen said. You know, we had mirror imaged uh, Putin for a long time, and uh, we just couldn't believe that we would see something that was more fit for the last century than, than now. But after it happened, uh, within a few days, uh, the U.S. went back to that old playbook of the U.S. during the Cold War days. Uh, and, and Joe Biden, of course, was around during those days. And he very quickly knew the things that he needed to say to the Allies. He knew what he needed to do. We had lots of mini summits, if you remember, in the month or so after the invasion took place. And the Allies lined up. Uh, and that's, that, to me, was interesting, coming as it did after the four years of Trump uh, and the problems and the buffeting, and not just during Trump, but during the Obama days, too. There was a bit of a drift of the U.S. away from the transatlantic relationship. But when things got bad, it all clicked back into place in a, in a format and in a relationship that felt very familiar. Uh, and so I think that was really something that... Uh, didn't necessarily uh, was would, would happen based on what we saw in the last four years with Trump and the relationship being as rocky, you know, to predict that that would be the response wasn't necessarily correct, but it actually worked. And I think that was a great relief to all of us. Great. Well, I totally agree with Jim and Kathleen. I, the one thing I should add with my bio that you forgot to mention is that I'm also co-host of a podcast with you <laughs> called The Eurofile, and everyone okay. should, should subs subscribe. <laughs> uh, it's a new podcast and talks about issues like this. But um, to me, I think that the European response to the war has, um, has been really remarkable. And I think this is where um, we in the United States, and I think Europeans themselves underestimated their own potential <laughs> resolve and strength. Um, I, there was a lot of kind of back briefs and sessions that were happening with the Europeans about sanctions prior to the war when we were very confident here in the United States and the administration that Russia was going to invade. There was a lot of planning about what sanctions should look like. Uh, and, you know, the Europeans were sort of going along. They were going along with this kind of hypothetical exercise. And the assumption in Washington was we were going to have to drag the Europeans uh, with us. That's kind of what happened in 2014 when, uh, when Russia seized Crimea. It wasn't until the downing of MH17, which then happened later in the summer, when you then saw strong sanctions packages. And what happened is when the tanks started rolling, uh, the shock, I think, in European uh, capitals was was very real, that this was an attack on Europe uh, and treated as such. And they started to come to the table with sanctions that we hadn't anticipated, hadn't thought about, central bank sanctions that were uh, um, offered and, and proposed by Mario Draghi, who working with Janet Yellen. Turns out it's a good thing to have uh, former central bankers that are you know, also political figures, that, that especially when you're sanctioning a really large economy like Russia. So we saw that strong um, response on sanctions. And one of the things that's happened over the last year is that didn't, they didn't atrophy, actually. That the EU right now is talking about a 10th round of sanction packages. While in 2014, the EU set sanctions and sort of forgot about it. It renewed them, but they were never really tightened or strengthened. Um, and then when you look at sort of the other aspects of the security response, I think Jim is right. Everyone sort of got in line behind the United States and sort of adopted, I mean, we adopted this really strong leadership position. We got allies in sync. The Biden administration deserves tremendous credit. But we also saw the Europeans uh, take steps that they hadn't really taken before. And that's the EU providing uh, security assistance funding, uh, 
uh, Germany and Sweden providing lethal weapons into a, uh, into a war zone, and Sweden and Finland deciding, you know what, we're, we're going to try to join NATO. Uh, and so we saw actually the Europeans suddenly taking security much more seriously, yes, getting in sort of in line with the United States, but doing, you know, frankly, a heck of a lot and more than I think people thought. Maybe one last point is that there's also concern about the migration question. You know, there's a huge rise in populism uh, in Europe. Um, and so there was concerns that when you had millions of Ukrainians fleeing Ukraine, what would be the political response? And thus far, the response has been, no, these are Europeans, uh, and we're going to um, uh, have them into our societies and, and, and support them. Uh, and we haven't seen any you know, political backlash to that. Um, and I don't think there's any, you know, any of that is uh, appearing on the horizon. I think that EU peace is important, perhaps less so on the defense elements, and we'll talk about that in a lot of detail on the NATO front. But it sounds to me from what you're saying that it really has provided the transatlantic community with complementary approaches to have the EU as an involved actor in this, on the sanctions piece, on the political piece, to bring Ukraine in the future into this political community, which is what attracted it in the first place. Do you feel like that's accurate, that the EU can play this complementary role? And then how does it play that interface with NATO as well? Yeah, I mean, that, that's firmly my view. And I think the, the idea that the EU is some sort of uh, challenge to the United States or NATO, I think, is completely misguided in that, you know, where the EU acts as one, which is on uh, economic issues. So when it comes to sanctions, it's not individual countries sanctioning uh, uh, Russia. It's the EU as an entity with a market uh, equivalent in size of the United States and China. And that's been the case with uh, our relations with the EU when it comes to Iran. Um, and in the beginning of this administration, we saw sanctions actually against China that was done uh, over Hong Kong and the Uyghurs. Uh, so I, I think the administration, the Biden administration, to its credit, saw that and I think has try, r tried to really elevate the Trade and Technology Council, its economic relations with the EU, its engagement with the EU, because it sees it as a really critical uh, actor, particularly when it comes to the uh, economic technology issues, because you know they're, they're the ones regulating our tech industry right now, uh, and, and can, we can do sanctions with. On the security side, I think there's still uh, a lot of room to grow there. Absolutely. And just to underscore that, um, you know, while the memberships of EU and NATO are overlap significantly, um, getting both organizations to work in a complementary fashion is really hard, right? And so, just to underscore that this is no mean feat. This is this is this is something important that, that we're seeing these organizations moving in the same direction on these issues. That's really yeah. important. I agree with, with both of those. I think another example is how the, uh, the EU has managed to tackle a lot of the energy problems because that's money. That's big money and it's, it's a humanitarian impact on the, the members of the EU in a cold winter. I mean, a few months ago, uh, there was a lot of hand-wringing uh, about uh, January, February being a time of darkness and cold in Western Europe as they had to deal with the cutoff of gas. Uh, and as well as industrial strength, uh, German industry and others no longer having gas to run the, the machines and this kind of thing. And so uh, there was going to be an economic uh, downfall. It was a, there was a lot of doom and gloom. Part of that's been alleviated by a milder winter, which so far, which is, which is really good. But I've been impressed with the EU uh, leadership in terms of dealing with this in the individual countries, both the national governments as well as the European Union, coming up with ways to find alternative sources of energy, having uh, the, uh, people turn down their, their thermostats. And, and there are all kinds of ways that were, that were uh, thought of, a lot of them very creative, to try to get around the energy problem. So you didn't see demonstrations on the street. You didn't see the kind of political pressure we were afraid of that wa was going to take some of the EU members out of the sanctions regime and, and have them become uh, more pro-Putin. You didn't see that kind of thing. And I think that says a lot for the EU as well, keeping just the keeping the peace there in Europe as they went through this dark period. Mm -hmm. And we've seen shifts in, in public opinion as well, on the support to the EU, but also on support to NATO, which I think is important. I think that's a good way to shift towards the NATO piece. Uh, Kathleen, you've written about the importance of NATO being NATO in this time. 
Can you talk us through why you think that? Why is NATO the best actor for this? And what does it bring in this particular instance over the last year? Um, it's often said, you know, if we didn't have NATO now, we'd want to invent it. Probably couldn't, <laughs> but we would want it. Um, and as, as Jim said, you know, when this crisis occurred, there were these institutions and relationships that, that, that had been well, well worked and well oiled over decades that allowed for the kind of fast communication and coordination needed to have a coherent and um, um, effective response to this crisis. Institutions matter. They really matter. You have to have these platforms for multilateral coordination and communication. And yes, they're frustrating. And yes, it takes forever to get um, consensus on an issue. But once you have consensus, you've got 30 of the world's most leading democracies saying, yes, we're moving in the same direction. That's powerful. Um, furthermore, uh, the alliance has, from the, 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 that's the political side, on the military side, it's created um, avenues for building interoperability amongst nations, which is basically, it's, it's not an e actually an easy thing to have a military A and military B join together on a battlefield and fight. It's actually really freaking hard. And there's all sorts of different cultural, um, technological, and other th things that can go horribly wrong and then just set the whole pl battle plan back. NATO has been working at this for oh, almost 75 years. That's important. And so not only did the alliance have the political capability to respond because of these, these institutional and alliance relationships. Again, alliances are, are made of people, right? And, and, and those human connections matter. But also because it's had the, the military uh, frameworks, institutions, command and control, so on and so forth, to be able to execute on on any plan that was put forward. Um, so yet yeah, NATO, I think, has, has powerfully demonstrated its importance in uh, responding to these kinds of major geopolitical crises. Yeah, keep in mind, too, that one of the Putin's many uh, misunderstandings and, uh, and wrong decisions were based on NATO not being able, or the nations of NATO, the transatlantic uh, community, not pulling together when he went into Ukraine. He, mm -hmm. It seems to me, and, and we all think we know Putin's mind, but it seems to me he made some assumptions, maybe fed by his own intelligence, that we would not be able to mount a very united front on this. And so NATO was a big part of us being able to do that. He misread NATO in crisis, which, as you know, is a headline in every journal article for the past 75 years, exactly. NATO at a crossroads. <laughs> yeah, it's always so, falling apart. Exactly. There's always, you know, there's it, always something. <laughs> there's always something. And so certainly he read too many of those articles. And so, you know, so he thought it was going to, you know, that there wasn't going to be the ability to do that. But one of the things that NATO does too, everything Kathleen said was absolutely right. And what I would add is the cherry on top is that while NATO itself as an institution, NATO is not at war with the Russians right now. It's a, not a NATO-Russia war. But with the U.S., as we gather the nations at the, in these coordinating uh, meetings every month uh, at Ramstein, uh, and as we work the transatlantic community to, to help Ukraine, it's NATO procedures, it's, NA it's, it's that, it's that um, community of NATO that's enabled us to do that. Because we've, you know, within the alliance, we meet all the time, we've been building the alliance uh, that uh, Kathleen was talking about. So while it's not NATO as an institution that is fighting Russia, the, our ability to come together as a community and be effective in supporting Ukraine, that has happened because NATO has helped shape us to be able to do that. You know, as I think about it, I can't imagine how we would have pulled off something like this without NATO and without the European Union, too. And the closest example could be World War II, where uh, the U.S. and the U.K., of course, uh, tried to put together a community of allies uh, and uh, eventually became the U.N. But that was the best we could do was trying to put together at that time what has now become NATO, what has become the U.N. and the EU. Uh, and that's where it started. And so uh, I just... Uh, I look on NATO as being really the root at the ability of this community to work together, That what we've seen for the past year. And, and not just on Ukraine, by the way, like on coalition operations globally, you know, we, if we didn't have the, inter the um, international military staff, if we didn't have those mechanisms for coordination and interoperability, we wouldn't be able to do all sorts of things around the world. Absolutely. And I think that's 
important. I think the, it's great that you're bringing up the fact that Ukraine's not the only thing, that the existing relationships are what allowed us to provide this united front so rapidly. And it's also a good way to remind us that there's still a lot of ambition being discussed and pushed inside NATO among the 30 allies. I mean, we just, there was a Madrid summit last year pushing forward new ideas. There's going to be a summit in July in Vilnius. There was a ministerial this week. Uh, I'd love to talk about that a little bit and how, Jim, if you want to start, how you assess this road since the nine months since Madrid, the commitments that have made and whether the war has derailed these efforts or helped push them forward or some in between? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, it's a great question. And I, 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 th I think what's, what has ha happened since Lisbon, I mean, they've been great attempts to push ahead a lot of the initiatives that came out of Lisbon, and they've been able to do a lot of it. But a, a feature of war like we're seeing in Europe now is all these other things happen to get in the way. What, what the Madrid road, the road after Madrid looked like it was going in one direction, but then it began to take a dog leg here and there because you had industrial problems happen, you had the tank debate with the Germans, you had all these other things happening uh, that uh, were not foreseen in Lisbon and slowed down a lot of you know, the ambition uh, that, uh, that the, you know, the summiteers saw that they were going to be doing in Madrid. It just ran into other things, but they were able to surmount it. So uh, as we approach Vilnius, I'm sure that'll, there'll be a report card on Madrid, so how far have we gotten? Uh, and I think there's some things uh, like uh, force deployments, and that type of thing, that were high priority that have been done. But I think there's going to be a lot of other things added to that list in Vilnius. And I'll, I'll tell you, I read the section's, uh, his press conference that he gave before the ministerial. You know, he does a press conference the day before. And he, uh, the section. And it was fascinating to me, all the little nuggets in there that a lot of people haven't picked up on uh, that they're going to talk about today and, and yesterday, and they'll probably put into, into action in Vilnius. One of them was building this constellation of satellites, uh, both commercial as well as nationally owned satellites to help out NATO in terms of communications and that type of thing. And having worked at NATO for a number of years, I, I, I couldn't believe that they just announced that uh, because it's a big deal. And the, secondly, they're going to do more in terms of, of uh, protecting undersea cables and pipelines. And that's that's not that that's new. That's an old problem. It's something that we've all been talking about. I remember at CNAS, one of my first uh, things that Julie Smith and I did at CNAS was on pipelines and this type of thing. But what's interesting is it has risen to in such a high priority. The section mentioned it in his, in his press conference. We know from Nord Stream 2 that sabotage that the Russians are quite adept at that. Um, and so I'm glad that we're going to do it. But I think, uh, I, think I, I certainly salute NATO for making the effort and highlighting this as a priority to set up a cell, you know, that's going to deal with how do we protect the, the pipelines and the communications nodes. So I think their, their agenda gets bigger and bigger. And that, of course, can crowd out Lisbon. So we'll, have, we'll see what happens in Vilnius. Max, you have a paper coming out on Europe one year on. How do you view these changes, including new members coming into the alliance. Well, I, th I think it's uh, totally transformative. And I think one of the things that when we think about the role NATO played, I mean, there's sort of an understated role in some ways where, you know, at the beginning phases of this war, even before the war began, as, you know, Russian forces were amassed around Ukraine, if we just imagine that Russian forces were successful and had taken Ukraine and were along uh, then along the border, not just of, a, of the Baltic states, but now of Poland, um, you know, and, and if NATO hadn't been there and if we hadn't reinforced and sent more forces uh, to the frontline states, states could get nervous about what Russia would be planning next, about what was... And, and you wouldn't necessarily see the same bold response. And this is, I think, why an alliance is so critical, is that it provides the surety to uh, European member states, to, uh, to Canada, to the United States, to others, that they're not going to be alone and they're not going to have to face you know, a very strong uh, military power on their own, which is you know, one of the things that uh, we saw in the, in the, in, in, at, during the beginning of World War II. And so I think NATO sort of then provides that overall security architecture, which then enables the kind of frank debates and discussions that then happen oftentimes at the European Union. Um, 
to me, I think what we saw, um, when I look back on Madrid, for instance, um, and sort of w one year on from the security side, I, I see a lot of advances. I see the Europeans really taking security seriously. But then looking at their stockpiles of equipment, uh, the state of their armed forces, and the cupboard is pretty bare. They've done a lot to support Ukraine. Uh, I think Stoltenberg yesterday uh, noted that you know ammunition is really critical, and Europeans are running out of that. So what, what we the situation we have now is uh, NATO at Madrid was about increasing the readiness of European forces. Yet in order to support Ukraine, which is of critical importance, you see the the amount of equipment that Europeans have to maintain their ready forces being eaten into. And this is going to require, I think, considerable investment. Uh, and European countries are pledging that. My fear, though, is that they're not necessarily going to be doing it in this sort of coordinated manner. And that's, that's I think, perhaps where the role of the European Union is sort of an underdeveloped aspect when we think about the security relationship. That's absolutely true. True. If I could just jump in on that. You know, uh, we ran out of ammunition when we did the Libya operation. Uh, we had trouble uh, at a CAOC also in Italy, you know, a command and control node for the Air Force, not enough people. We had trouble during the, the Kosovo Air Campaign as well. So NATO was known that we were always skating on thin ice when it came, came to capabilities because just in terms of ammunition, how much ammunition should Denmark buy during a time of peace? I mean, making the case that we need a big storehouse, that would have been almost impossible. So we went into this conflict uh, with not a whole lot in the cupboard. And so, so I think while there are advances and things that, that, that certainly happened in Lisbon, we have smoked out a lot of problems within NATO as well. And, um, you know, like Max said, this is going to call for a lot of investment in terms of, and this was also in the sections, uh, press statement, there's going to be a lot of investment that needs to be made in uh, supply lines and in production lines in both Europe and the United States in our industry. That is really, really hard. I mean, Kathleen was talking about how hard it is to have NATO and the EU work together. Try the defense industries on both sides. It's very difficult when there's money there and there's an uncertain future in terms of, well, are we going to need the same amount of ammunition five years from now? Uh, and so that's going to be a really, really big issue. And I think Vilnius is going to have to have to tackle that. And I do believe, I think you're absolutely right, Max, that uh, this is where the European Union hopefully could be a very helpful player in terms of how do you coordinate European defense industry, U.S. defense industry, so that they both can share in meeting the demands that we have for things like ammunition or tanks or other things, that we don't waste time in terms of competing and beating at each other, that we work together uh, to try to quickly restock and uh, get ready for whatever comes next. Follow on from that point, and actually to, to riff off of one of our colleagues at CSIS, uh, Cynthia Cook, who runs our Defense Industrial Initiatives Group, when you think about the next level down, because like, so we all recognize that we've got these empty bins, is what um, some are calling it, in terms of um, defense industrial capacity and what we actually have in terms of ammunition. Um, what do you actually do to fill the bins again? is really hard. Do you add shifts? Do you have to add new factories? If you have to do new factories, where's the site's going to be? These are incredibly technical questions and um, are going to require a lot of hard thinking and, and probably some hard choices on uh, behalf of the defense industry and behalf of the governments that are um, buying from them. Um, my sense, though, is that without a very strong signal from NATO allied governments, that th these are investments that are going to be enduring. We're going to have these stockpile problems hit us over and over again, and we can't afford to have that. So let's dig into that a little bit. What, in your view, what does it take to get that sustained commitment? Is it more involvement in the private sector? I mean, from the ministerial that we saw, what came out yesterday, industrial capacity and stockpiles is very much at the forefront of those concerns. Who needs to act at which point of this chain and the levels down? <laughs> I think you feel like that's like the hundred thousand dollar or like a billion dollar question, right? Well, after yeah. Your oh yeah, totes. Okay, so I, I got it, guys. <laughs> um, there are experts that are much better at, at coming up with better answers than that. But I will take a quick stab. Um, 
and that is the regulatory processes and the acquisition processes that we have within, like particularly the U.S. Department of Defense and the U.S. government writ large. Um, it's Byzantine, it's bureaucratic, it's cumbersome. There's all sorts of weird, squirrely um, bits to the federal acquisition regulations that make it hard for a pledge to be seen through over time. Um, and defense acquisition reform, I mean, I feel like like the, the, the term makes people want to run screaming because we've talked about it for decades. But it's true, like if we can't get our own institutional and bureaucratic house in order to buy kit when we need it, then um, we're not gonna make progress. I would also note though, um, the federal acquisition regulations has at least has been interpreted over the past couple of decades has really prioritized um, efficiency over effectiveness. And basically, is it, um, are you getting the best value to the taxpayer? That's a, a really important question, of course. But when you prioritize efficiency rather than effectiveness, you're taking risk that you're not going to have the capabilities that you need and you're not going to have surpluses that you need. So it seems to me that there's probably a paradigm shift that is, if it hasn't begun occurring, it probably needs to when we think about how we buy equipment. And I think that probably applies to both sides of the Atlantic. And, and you know, just to roll the dice on something that is so complicated, but to <laughs> add a couple points. During the Cold War, we had a, a th th this isn't a new issue, you know. Uh, a lot of what Kathleen was describing came after the Cold War, where that demand signal and all the money wasn't as uh, forceful uh, as it was then. Uh, during the Cold War, we had uh, the national security requirements were pretty high, and that that uh, kind of trumped any other kind of rules and regulations that might have constrained it. One of the things that we had, and I think we still have them, but they were they're government-owned, contractor-operated facilities, uh, their arsenals, and and they were the ones that were in charge of making certain kinds of ammunition and this type of thing, because it was something that it wasn't. Um, you know, at the whim of the commercial market. It wasn't run by a company that says, look, the demand signal for 155 millimeter ammo has gone down, so we're gonna close this line down. This was actually a, a uh, production line owned by the government. And the government says, well, we're gonna keep it open. We're gonna keep it warm because we don't know when we might have to surge. Uh, and so, uh, so you had that ability to surge when you needed it. And so that kind of thing left when we said, look, let's have the commercial sector take all this over. Why is the government in the business of competing uh, with the private sector making 155 ammo? Uh, and so a lot of the things that we did back then uh, that was not uh, competitive really, but it was government owned, was meant to give us the ability to surge. And that went away. And it might be that we're gonna have to go back to that kind yeah. of thing. But also, we've got European partners that make 155 millimeter ammo too, although sometimes there's a little difference between the two, which I think they're going to have to work out. But, but I think we now have within the European Union a partner where we can also shift some of the burden to providing uh, common use ammo and this type of thing that can also be shared by European industry. So I think there's a lot to do, but it goes back to what Kathleen was hinting at, which is it takes a long time. We don't have that time anymore. I think just uh to sort of echo what Kathleen said, all the problems of defense acquisition that you know, we see here in the United States, well, you sort of multiply that by 27 EU members, 30 NATO members, and you know, they all need to buy the same kit, essentially. And one of the challenges, and this is, I think, really when we look at kind of the European security architecture, where I think the bottom-up role that the EU could play, where, you know, if if and this is you know if the Dutch and the Germans each need to buy you know a, a vehicle, well they have, will have different requirements for it and they'll have different procurement agencies and and well you know the Germans want the coffee cup holder on the left side and the Dutch on the right side and it doesn't matter just you know they can they we can figure those if we can figure out the same requirements uh, and then you can make joint bids so that then NATO countries are operating the same equipment, it makes deployment a lot easier, it makes things cheaper, uh, and this is where I frankly think it's sort of beyond NATO to some degree, because NATO is a multilateral alliance, and what the strength of the EU is, look, the EU countries are, you know, are cooperating on their, their budgets, on really technical economic issues that set rules and regulations throughout their market economies. Their market economies are joined together in a single market, 
where, but that hasn't really occurred in the defense space in creating sort of a common European defense market. And, and this is where the United States, I think, needs to look a little bit at ourselves in the mirror when we look forward at this. Because right now, if you're Poland or and you've given all your tanks away, you want to buy new tanks, well, you're going to the United States or you're going to Korea because you can you know, get them quickly. But there isn't, the, the European defense industrial base is very hollow. Uh, in part because uh, there isn't really one. It's, there isn't a common market. And when we prioritize many of our arms sales, which make a lot of sense for Europeans to buy American, but it would also make sense for Europe to develop, you know, really have its uh, you know, really vibrant defense industries, which would probably then support European jobs and there'd be more incentives for European spending. But we haven't really looked at it through that lens. And I think that's something that we need to, I think, consider sort of backing off our opposition to the creation of a common European defense market is something that I think U.S. policymakers should really start to consider. That's a lot of old habits to do away with, I think, on the, yeah, on the political I mean, it's, side. It, it's, I mean, it's tough because what is the job of a diplomat in, in Europe? Well, first and foremost is oftentimes to push for U.S. companies. Uh, you want the United States to do business, arms sales, strengthen diplomatic relations. And I'm not saying they should stop. What I'm saying is that uh, some of our, our, our views on, on European defense, that we play a role in, in some of what, some of the dysfunction that we see, and that I think we need to think more proactively about how we uh, go about addressing that. Before we move on to what I think is a really important last piece of, of our conversation in looking at the coming year, I want to step back a little bit to look at this past year in terms of political will, which seems necessary even for questions of armament but at the center of some of the conversations happening at NATO as well. We've seen a lot of political will to bring in new members, but also tensions within the alliance, potentially preventing these members from really entering full, uh, fully. Have these tensions been overblown when we talk about pro primarily Turkey, Hungary, or are they being taken seriously? And do you see them clearing up in this, on this road to Vilnius? Well, I think one thing about NATO that everyone probably knows, but just to state that that when you have that many uh, European nations and North, North Atlantic as well, Canada, U.S., in that uh, alliance, there's naturally fissures there. Uh, always have been. North, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, uh, Western Europe are the older uh, allies who feel they run Europe. And then when we had enlargement, you brought in Central European nations who have a different view as well. And so, um, so there are natural fissures there anyway. Secondly is everybody brings their national agendas into the alliance. You're not supposed to. You're not supposed to bring national problems in there. And I think everyone tries not to bring a national problem between it with another ally into the, on the table. But uh, everyone has their, uh, their agendas, and they try to win the day to get what they want in terms of what NATO might be doing. Some nations are more aggressive and public about what they want done, and they are more aggressive in terms of taking hostage uh, various issues until they get their way. Uh, and uh, that happens particularly during election season, and so I think we're getting a, a very good lesson on that. The master at this, of course, is Erdogan, and he is up for re-election, and, uh, and so we've seen uh, him use his NATO card to try to not that he necessarily had anything against Turkey and, I mean, against uh, Finland and Sweden. I know he did have some issues with Sweden, but, but it was more that he was running for election and, and uh, he was going to be looking tough to the Turkish people. And so these things were going on. So, uh, so that brings tensions, uh, spiky tensions. I mean, it's not all the time with Turkey, but, but uh, France, other nations also have issues there. And, and it makes it spiky and it makes it hard to get things done. So. Um, so, you know, that doesn't mean that NATO is in trouble. It doesn't mean that N NATO is at a crossroads, NATO is at a crisis, that NATO should be re totally redone. Uh, it just is one of these things that you take into account in trying to get things done. It's like the Congress, quite frankly. When I was there, I was just shocked about how much it was like the Congress, because if you want to get something done at NATO or on the Hill, you got to gather your allies, you got to, you know, do, do those, th those things to get the votes. And you need to do the same thing there at, at NATO, because, because everyone comes in there with a different view. That doesn't mean the Congress is broken, although these days I might change my mind on that, but uh, nor does it mean that, that uh, NATO is broken, but it's just the way things work in NATO and in the European Union too.
that's the, 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 the basics of coalition politics, right? You know, it, it, it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of, and that's why having these institutions for decades matters, right? Yeah. Because there's ways to start to build consensus. Yeah. Um, to, to put what Jim said a slightly different way, um, where you sit is where you stand. And the Central and Eastern European allies are sitting close to a very dangerous immediate threat. Um, when you get further away from a NATO's eastern flank, um, you start to see capitals having different security priorities, like fragility in the Middle East, North Africa region, um, terrorism, migration, so on and so forth. And NATO has done, and this was reflected in the Madrid summit, um, I think a pretty admirable job of bringing together those different pers security perspectives and, and, and coming up with a common vision where everybody can advance towards a, a, a vision of security that addresses those different security perspectives and, and priorities. But as we just discussed, it's a human institution and it requires constant work. It co requires um, constant uh, at attendance. Like it, it's, it's, um, it's not, NATO's not something that you can just sort of leave out in the margins and like, and just think it's, it's all gonna be great. Everybody's gonna sort of swim in the same direction. No, it takes work. And so maintaining the kind of political cohesion that we've seen after, you know, in the wake of Madrid or I guess in, in Madrid and beforehand, um, it's going to take a lot of effort. And I do worry that we might put it on autopilot again. And if we do that, then I think a lot of the, the political coherence and political will that we've, we've been able to build might, might evaporate. If I could jump on, if you, I know Max just wants to jump in there. As Andrea would say to me in Brussels spouse, Jim, I know you want to jump in, but I have a question. Um, just to say that putting on autopilot, putting NATO on autopilot is what the U.S. has tended to do in the past, certainly since the end of the Cold War. Uh, there were times um, when I was the DASD, uh, during the Obama days, it was, uh, it was put on autopilot a lot. As much as I would jump up and down and scream, it was on autopilot. And, and what Kathleen says is exactly right. We cannot allow that to happen. There's a lot of things that go off the rails when the U.S. is not in there leading. And that's really, really critical. Your time to jump in. Yeah, I know. Um, well, good plug for Brussels Sprouts. Yeah, well, Excellent know, podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, now's yeah. the time. Now, I, I, I totally agree. I think when we look ahead, the, the fear that I have, and, and Jim, you sort of mentioned this, I think, in your initial comments, um, that what happened with this war is suddenly America was back, and we were back fully. I mean, we've provided more than $25 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. U.S. forces are in Europe. And, uh, and from a European perspective, that's great. We're engaging fully. Uh, but then, you know, there's a, a, a Chinese balloon and, and our attention shifts. Uh, we're now entering the second year of this war. Where will we be in year three, year four? And we can, you know, we'll maintain a high level of security assistance. We're going to make the trips for defense minister meetings, for, uh, uh, for, for leaders meetings. It, it will all be there. But you can also start to see Europeans now increasingly nervous about their security in the years ahead. Uh, spending now hitting 2%, but realizing that even with that spending increase, they still have huge deficiencies in which they're really reliant on the US. They also have security challenges, uh, maybe not for the Eastern states, but in, in the Sahel, in the Mediterranean, and in the Middle East, regions that you know, we used to be obsessed with, and then no longer, yeah. you know, that's no longer a real national security prioritized. And so one of the things that we had over the few, last few decades when you were at DASDI is while there wasn't that much focus on Europe, there was at least focus on Europe's neighborhood. And that's gonna go away. And so I think my fear is that we're, we may not have used this crisis to, uh, to transform some of the issues that uh, are plaguing the alliance. And that while there's a European understanding of defense, it is still now firmly rooted in um, reliance on the United States which I think is, I think in general is fine, but you're gonna, I think, see 
tensions in, in the years ahead, potentially, unless there's major steps taken. If I could um, jump on, in on that. There's a debate in Washington about whether or not what, how the, the war in Ukraine has transpired, if that means that we can redirect our attention and assets back to in, Indo-PACOM, which is China's our pacing threat. And so the idea being that, well, the Russian military has not been effective. Europe is beginning to step up. We've been encouraging them to step up for decades. So now it's time to, to focus our attention on China. The problem with that argument is that if, God forbid, a contingency with China, or a, a crisis with China really turned into something like an act of conflict, we don't get to win that conflict without our NATO allies. Right, and we don't get to manage the global security environment, manage the risk of a, a, um, Russia being a resurgent or um, uh, opportunistic during that crisis. We don't get to manage that risk effectively without our NATO partners. So, I, 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 in Washington, I worry about this this false dichotomy about you know prioritization of Russia or China. Actually, we need to think holistically. We need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah, this zero-sum game view is counterproductive as we're trying to figure out how to avoid the autopilot, how to swift, swift, switch back into old habits and maintain the alignment and support to Ukraine, both political and military, while recognizing in the U.S. there are other things on the minds of this administration, but in Europe as well. We're... This winter has been pretty mild. The next one might not be, and energy reserves are going to look very different. Um, military cap capacity, and then a lot of elections coming up, as we discussed. I think avoiding the zero-sum game mentality is going to be crucial. Uh, Max, do you want to jump in on this? Oh, Jim. You, you could, well, just I'll jump Please. in on something Max said, yeah. uh, and and I think this is really critical. He was talking about this, or was it Kathleen? Talking about the dependency on. Uh, the United States, that this has shown that, that dependency. And, uh, uh, and that is something that is, is not healthy. Uh, it's something that has stunted in the past the, the creation of this European defense industry that we've talked about. It's been kept low because there was a, 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 a dependency on the U.S. for off the shelf and this type of thing. And, and uh, so how do, we, how do we break that dependency and try to make it more balanced so that we can surge other places if we need to? And that takes us through strategic autonomy. You know, and I know that name just rises hackles all over Washington, and, and it was just, but I think it's something we have to look at and say, you know, strategic autonomy is just another way of saying, allowing, the, allowing and helping and nurturing the Europeans to do, Max, I think is what you were saying, to build this uh, European defense capability, European military capability, to be able to stand on their own feet uh, and to be able to take a handoff from us and not have this dependency. So for Europe to do that, there's got to be a collective action by those nations to create this autonomy. Uh, and, uh, and that's not directed at the United States. I mean, I've, I have worked this for decades, truly decades. It's not aimed at us. It used to be. But it's not aimed at us now, uh, frankly, and we shouldn't be so afraid of it. But we will always have this dependency unless we can somehow help the Europeans work together to build that capability to do what they need to do to take a handoff from us. Yeah, I, I, I just on that, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think, look, there was, there is an element of strategic autonomy, which is, well, we want to be able to make decisions independent of the United States and not be so reliant, so, so we're, we can sort of break, break free. But really what this is, is that, you know, if you need to get uh, EU citizens out of, uh, of a, a country's capital, uh, whether it's sub-Saharan Africa or Afghanistan, you have to call the U.S. military to do it. Uh, and Europeans don't have the capacity to do basic things that a, an economy the size that they have should be able to do. Uh, and this is really in our interest because, uh, you know, if we're not paying attention to the Sahel and the Middle East and other places, well, we would want the Europeans to be able to have the capacity to act. And also, if there was a, a, a contingency in the Indo-Pacific, Europe being stronger 
will enable us to be stronger in the Pacific. And also, you know, every war that we have fought in, in the last few, Europeans have been there. Maybe it's not been NATO as an institution always. NATO was there in Afghanistan, not in Iraq, but in Iraq we had other Europeans. And I think the same would be the case, but it's really about us trying to figure out we are sort of stuck in this. We want to be indispensable, actually. We kind of really enjoy our indispensable position. But then another part of us really wants the Europeans to be autonomous because we're sick of them being totally incapable. And, and we need to, I think, figure out and how to, how to kind of push in that direction. But I think you were going to ask about energy, right? Or the, we can. Yeah. It sounds like you want to talk about oh, energy. I just, I just think this is a, a critical point, is that you know, the expectation was like Europe was going to be brought to its economic knees by, um, by the war. And one of the things, and this just gets to the broader uh, importance of strength of democracies, is that we don't really dwell on our successes <laughs> too much. And what we saw was, uh, you know, the Germans, in the course of less than a year, break their dependency on Russian gas that we thought would bring their economy totally down. Now, it's caught, it had an economic hit, but Germany didn't fall into a recession. You had a green uh, environment and economy minister buying LNG from Qatar and the United States, doing whatever it took to get through the crisis. And I think that w that's part of the European will and European resolve that, you know, smart, well-run democracies faced with real crises and challenges tend to figure it out. Uh, and I think that's how we'll, I hopefully see it over, over the course of this, this next year too. Yeah. So before I ask you to take out your crystal balls, I'll ask one last question on the NATO front, since I think this is on the forefront of everybody's mind these days, looking ahead to the next year, but even just the next six months, speaking of democracies trying to strengthen themselves, do you see the alliance trying to just shore up the commitments that have already been made or try to push forward and add to the ambition that we're seeing. The defense investment pledge and like two percent. Yes. <laughs> I have a slightly different take on this issue, um, which is to say, defense spending is critically important. Um, it's, allies have struggled to meet their defense investment pledges in, for, in Wales in 2014. We've been talking about two percent for decades, but. Um, so, so there is a recognition that in terms of defense spending, 2% probably is not sufficient. And whether or not it can be agreed in Vilnius that we move to 3% or whatever the number might be, um, again, is a reflection of, you know, the, given the stockpile issues that we're seeing, given the, the, the longstanding capability challenges, that the probably need to be spending more. However, one of the things that I worry about um, is that when we focus on how much allies are spending on defense, that we start thinking about the alliance in terms of you know, dollars and euros. It's a transactional, it's cost sharing. It's not burden sharing, right? An alliance, the, the reason the alliance is so powerful and so useful, it gives us these human connections to be able to come up with common strategies on a variety of challenges um, that, that include defense and, and military material, but so much more broad, like China and its activities in Europe, energy security, um, advanced technologies and how might they may be having a uh, damaging impact on our security, um, terrorism, migration, so many issues. That's the, that's the purpose of the, the alliance. The NATO is a political military institution. And we, we consistently, constantly focus on this narrow soda straw of an issue of defense spending. We are at risk of, of just poisoning the well, having a toxic conversation yet again that's just about cost sharing rather than how we're going to address these challenges together. Yeah, no, that's that's very true. Uh, that you know, the the, the um, first to go to your question about is it going to be just trying to bring home the stuff that we had agreed earlier? Or are we going to be adding to it? And then the answer is both. You know, at Vilnius, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna see how far we were able to get and what needs to be done to spur the you know further progress of the Lisbon uh, ideas. But also, uh, they're going to be adding a lot of things to it. I think it's going to be amazing what they're going to add to it and. And, and I am more power to NATO to taking on this workload. 
but the point that Kathleen's making on the 2% is going to be big at Vilnius too. And it's important for everyone to realize there's a history to that 2%. Uh, and that, and, and just the thumbnail is that 2% wasn't backed by any great analysis or stuff. I'm not even sure who <laughs> plucked it out of thin air, uh, but during the... <laughs> well, I, you know, during the Cold War, it was like 3.5, I think. And the thing is that 2% is a mark, it's a political mark on the wall. And I was reminded of that when I was, uh, when I was the Dasty, I was trying to get rid of it uh, because of a lot of the reasons that Kathleen was talking about. And that the word had gotten back to London, and I got a call from a MP uh, on his car phone uh, saying, uh, I heard you're trying to get rid of the 2%. And I, I said, well, I mean, I wouldn't say that, but we have to rethink it. Should it be more? Should it be less? Should we, you know? And he goes, well, listen, that 2% is what helps me get defense spending in the UK higher. It'll be cut if I don't have a target to shoot at. That 2% is a target. If you get rid of that, I'm not going to be able to be very convincing uh, because we don't have, you know, this, 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 this mark that we're trying to hit. So please don't get rid of the 2%. So I said, okay, but that takes us to what Kathleen's saying. I mean, okay, fine, that's a, that's a mark on the wall, but it has taken on a life of its own. It doesn't have any analysis behind it, and there are bigger things that we're going to have to figure out. And the 2% mark on the wall came during a time of uh, a Europe whole free and at peace in the 1990s. You know, that's not really where we are today. Uh, so we really do have to figure out uh, with at, at Vilnius, I mean, we can launch 3.5, we can say 2% is a floor, not a ceiling, and, and you know, they'll have to get consensus on something, because when it comes to money, there's a lot of, you know, this at NATO. So, but I think we need to put some hard thinking behind it, too, some analysis behind it. What makes the most sense to get us to what is really important, and that is getting allies to bring more to the table. Uh, because just because a nation meets 2%, and there's a particular nation at NATO that goes over 2%, and I don't know what they're spending that money on, uh, but uh, just because you spend 2%, that doesn't mean you're going to spend it on the right things, and that doesn't mean you're going to use it in the, doing the NATO's business. So uh, there's a lot more that we're going to have to do at, at Vilnius, along with what Kathleen said, to, to bring home more of that capability. Yeah, I'm... <sighs> I have to say, I'm a little terrified of going to 3% and setting out a new goal because I sort of think we're, we're then putting this sort of new decades-long diplomatic headache for uh, something that is probably not going to be a, a, obtained. Uh, and I'm not actually sure that if every country spent 3% in the, in the next year, that that would address a lot of the problems that we have. I mean, it would, it would be hugely beneficial, obviously, if there's more money being spent. But to me, and I, I think it's a good point on 2%, it should be the floor, and I think that's where we're, we're, we're getting. But it, it, we know what European forces need, uh, and so in some ways, instead of each country spending just a marginal amount more, if that money's pooled, whether through NATO or the EU, and this is where I think the EU um, could play this 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 role in terms of its funding and financing. And I thought the president, when he went to a European Council meeting last March, and there was a French proposal on the table to borrow more funding for defense, the U.S. sort of missed an opportunity to not endorse that. Because, look, if there's a common pool of money and you're making big acquisitions, because what defense companies need, they need big checks to say, okay, go forth and start producing all the tanks, right? We're going to need 1,000 tanks you, you know, you want to plan, here's the money, but individual countries aren't really, are going to struggle to, to cooperate. We have a report coming out um, that points to uh, European defense cooperation has actually gotten worse over the last decade. So I think it's really about trying to figure out how we cooperate more uh, and spend the money that we're spending more wisely. Uh, and and I don't know if, the, in, in spending more cooperatively, I don't know if that's done through uh, defense spending. I think one, one just quick additional point is I also think that one of the big challenges is going to be to continuing to support Ukraine and provide, finding equipment, buying equipment to support Ukraine. We're not, right now giving hand-me-downs, but we're running out of those. And now we're just going to have to go to the store, go to the companies, and actually buy the equipment. And I think that is where, you know, we've seen the EU with the European Peace Facility. That is one uh, big uh, source of revenue. But more, there's we need to be more funding for that. And I think that's something NATO is reckoning with right now, and I think we'll need to do so at Vilnius.
I think those are issues CSAS is going to keep working, working on through transforming European defense project and a lot of work that you're doing collaboratively with the international security program as well. And, you know, I have to say that I wish we'd all been having this discussion 10 years ago because now when we need it to deal with Russia, we don't have it. And so we're scrambling to do things we should have done in the past. And we warned them and warned them. You, you actually made this point I know, 10 years ago. I know, that we should I be know. having this conversation. You never listen to me. <laughs> uh, you know. But it is, so we're going to now go ahead and increase defense spending. But, you know, we can increase defense spending or do other ways to get capability. And that won't show up for 10 years. Yeah. And it's kind of late. And, and so that's what makes me sad at the end of the day is we just, it goes to your point on political will. We didn't have the political will uh, until the wolf came to the door. And I used to say this at NATO all the time. When the wolf comes to your door, it's too late. So, anyway. Or bear. <laughs> or bear, yeah. <laughs> well, in the last couple minutes we have left, I think is a great time to, for you to predict what we should be thinking about in 10 years. I'd like all of you to take out your crystal balls, read the tea leaves, insert whatever metaphor you prefer about the future. Just very briefly, what is one in the coming year related to this conversation we're having on European security, Ukraine, um, what is a dark horse event that keeps you up at night? And one of the most sig potentially significant positive evolution that you foresee in the transatlantic relationship or would like to see? You can take this however you want. Dark horse for me is um, nuclear use in this conflict. Um, we have not experienced that, that kind of um, weapon use since, you know, World War II, thank God. Um, but that's a terrible and possibly powerful game changer. Um, and I think when we, when we think about nuclear, when we think about deterrence and um, deterrence by denial or deterrence by um, uh, pu by punishment, um, and we think about a, a nuclear use in this contingency. There are things that we are doing that that um, or, or or could be doing that might complicate uh, a response if if, there, if Russia decides to use a nuclear weapon in Ukraine somehow. And so, how does the alliance respond to that? How you know? The, the, the procedures, the, the, um, the, the, the mechanisms for that kind of communication and consultation with the NATO, I think, are, are reasonably certain. You know better than I do. Um, but that will be a massive test of resolve and resilience and, um, and, and communication. It's, it's just, it's so much. And again, that's, that's the, the dark horse that I worry about. You know, I have to say, I, I agree with Kathleen on that. And as my CNAS colleagues will know, uh, we've had some Brussels sprouts discussions on this that got quite dark in trying to figure that out. Uh, uh, and so I would, uh, my dark horse on all this, and I don't think this will come to pass, uh, but we have to be ready for it, is that if Ukraine, if, if our support for Ukraine falters, uh, and Ukraine ends up uh, being overrun by a Russian army that has gotten really big of un not well-trained and not well-armed Russian uh, conscripts and uh, mobilized people. And, but, but it turns out that they just become uh, overwhelming uh, and Russia ends up uh, defeating Ukraine uh, and, and our support stops. What will Russia do with that huge army? And, it, and that huge army that he will have put together to take Ukraine would be facing a Europe still trying to rebuild its military capability. We've been talking about how they can do it, et cetera. But as I said, you know, what we're talking about here uh, might come to fruition five years from now, 10 years from now, not today. Uh, and so in that case, you will have a lot of the European allies not having a lot of their equipment having been destroyed in Ukraine or gone. Not a lot of uh, deliveries to restock their arsenals, uh, feeling very weak. And, of course, the United States uh, would be standing with them. But we would find ourselves in Europe in a perilous place just in terms of conventional, not even the nuclear, but just in terms of conventional, facing a Russia with a bloodlust uh, 
that has this huge military, this huge conventional military, and trying to figure out, so what is he going to do with that? Uh, and, and knowing in the United States that Europe uh, is, is, is prostrate in front of them and that we're going to have to step in there. And then, and then I'm not even going to think about China. So frankly, that's what keeps me up that. And it actually does. I wake up and think that if we are not successful in Ukraine, we could be facing a terrible problem in Central Europe with a Russia with a huge army. Uh, and um, and, a, and a, a leader who's not going to say, okay, I'm done now, I'm going to demobilize these guys and we're going to go back to business as usual. Right. And, and, I mean, and it raises the posture questions. So oh, yeah. It, you yeah. Know, how, how, what should our, our presence look like ne- you know, in, in the now and in the future? How do we hedge against the possibility of, of that scenario? Yeah, how do you hedge? Exactly. What Kathleen is saying, what would, if that began to look like the trend, would we then begin to beef up the U.S. force posture in there mm-hmm. to begin to hedge? And what does that mean in terms of escalation? What will Russia say when it sees uh, more rotations coming in, and maybe permanent instead of rotational? Uh, so that's, that's the dark horse for me. As I said, I don't think that's going to happen. But I didn't think Russia was going to invade Ukraine either. It's, it's, but it's also our job to think through these things. Yes, that's true. <laughs> yeah. right. Maybe a positive note. Well, <laughs> well, I was going to add. So I think what Europeans would say on the dark horse would be our election in, in 2024. Then there's that. And, <laughs> and the potential for, for a president that is, is less inclined to, to support the transatlantic alliance. But I, I share Jim's uh, concern. I think when we think about security assistance uh, to Ukraine, how pivotal that is, uh, Michael Kimmage, uh, one of our, our colleagues, uh, mentioned at an event earlier today, actually, on Russia, that you know wars are basically fights of political economy. And Russia's political economy compared to the West political economy, it's just, you know, it, it's completely at a, they're completely overmatched. Uh, but Russia overmatches Ukraine's. And so if our support for Ukraine dwindles, then this is where the scenario that, um, that Jim outlined uh, co- becomes real. And I think it's going to be much harder this year to provide the same level of assistance uh, we're going to ha- there are means and uh, there's other means that the United States can provide assistance that ne- doesn't need to go through Congress. But that uh, all of those require friction, require bureaucratic trade offs between ta- you know, taking systems that would be for the Indo-Pacific to Europe. And that's going to uh, put some sand in the gears, I think, of our of the speed at which we can provide things. And then if the Europeans are running out of equipment and the, the industries aren't really uh, pumping, that is, I think, the, the concern. But, you know, I think on the, to leave on maybe on a positive note, uh, look, if a year ago, if you had told me all the things that the Europeans were going to do, all the things that we would do, and in fact, I actually wrote a piece at the Center for American Progress that was like, what we should do if Russia invades. And I think I hit all the points, but I really underestimated how far we would go. Uh, how strong the Ukrainians would be. Uh, and, you know, things like the UK evicting all the Russian oligarchs that had uh, really infiltrated uh, UK's economy and, 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 and politics just sort of overnight, I think, is, is really extraordinary. So we have taken uh, immense steps. And I think when I look forward, I'm not, I don't have that many sleepless nights because I think what we've sort of demonstrated is the strength of the transatlantic alliance of Europe of democracy over the last year. Thank you for ending on a positive <laughs> note. <laughs> but it's important is to remind the absolute necessity of this united transatlantic community and the support to Ukraine. So I want to thank all of you very much for joining us today. For the audience online, please stay engaged with the work that CSIS is putting out on this, CNAS as well, Brussels Sprouts. If you heard just that name during the event, <laughs> it was a podcast, not just Brussels Sprouts, <laughs> Europhile, and then Smart Women, Smart Power as well. Thank you again so much and have a great day. Thank you.